I'm Dan Scott Wesser. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, y'all. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm going to be reading a very short essay from a collection of essays that's coming out in February of next year um, called The Fabulous Ekphrastic Fantastic with an exclamation mark. <laughs> and um, it's a series of ekphrastic essays. Um, and it's kind of fusing visual criticism with memoir. And this one is very memoir. This particular section, and it's about David Bowie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have a captive crowd. It's right? <laughs> great. When I start singing, you might cringe. <laughs> it's called Life on Mars. <laughs> you stand in a space, a no space, gleaming white background light. You wear a powder blue suit, so long on the thin of you, as if your limbs were mere piping for the hang of fabric. Royal blue eyeshadow pales against your flat gray eyes, orange rock or mullet, pink lips. It looks like a girl, my father says. I am inches from the cathode tube of our MTV, in the living room of our ranch-style duplex, in the center of Kaneohe Bay Naval Base, my father's Marine Corps biceps, repetitively flexing in the reflection of the screen as he lifts the dumb weights of his ego. It must be gay, my father says behind me. His forearm rising and falling like a breathing machine, like a machine, like a non-breathing machine. I can't quit staring at the video. Simple, no story, you in makeup. You sing directly into the camera. You face me. And I know somehow this is not about you looking like a girl. It's about something bigger. I am seven. You made the video to Life on Mars in the mid-70s when your alter ego Ziggy folded into your entire self, where only corners of Davy Jones were peeling away from the celluloid. This was your most prolific time, full of concert tours and cocaine, of simulating fellatio with Ronson's guitar and songs of capitalist exhaustion. Of course, I may not have known this, known most of this at seven years old, but what I did know was that you were mine one of my tribe, even though I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. I didn't know this until much later, but you began writing your life story on the very day my life began. Before Prince, before Susie Sue, before funk singer Betty Davis, was you, my first icon, idol. While God demanded we make no images in the likeness of the divine, I wanted to paint myself into Ziggy. Lightning bolted and spiky, neon and ghost. I would align my face with yours on the screen, match our delineations, our features, until my eyes blurred from the bright knowledge. I didn't know this until much later, but you once told the press that Los Angeles should be wiped off the face of the earth. <laughs> my time of knowing was that in between, after the nude begins and before the real revolution began before metrosexual and gender fluid, before trans and queer. There was man, there was woman, there was gay, there was straight. There was baseball and baking. <laughs> and then there was you, yeah. and in between. And nothing in particular, and yet a glimmer of all those things. I felt safer in the nowhere space, that ambiguity. I never colored within the lines, never danced to the steps. I looked across the flat, concrete, military base horizon and knew that you were precisely on the other side of this round planet, that if I dug below my feet long enough, the tunnel would be the spine of our world. I was certain we were made of the same hole. You were a dancer. You loved commedia. You lived for funk records, said you heard God when you listened to Little Richard. Your mother's name was Peggy. I mentioned this to my Peggy. She said, he is really a good musician. She said, he knows a lot about space. She said, he is a bit weird, though. And she ran her fingers in my Auburn mop and winked a wink that could be seen across the galaxy. I didn't know this until much later, 
but you are a fairy tale tin man pushed by a bulldozer to where you never let us know ashes to ashes funk to funky i have never felt i have felt the metallic chase of that machine for so long i guess neither of us knew where it would end us up my second grade class portraits my mother dressed me in a white oxford and black slacks and a smooth cowlick she sent me off spiffy as she would say but I knew you would never allow the camera to capture you in something so boxed, so buttoned. <laughs> when I arrived to school, I pulled out the sleeveless mesh top with a royal blue bolt across the chest that my friend Amanda found at a yard sale. I ran water through my auburn mop and pulled it to the sky. I walked to the flashing bulb and faux forest backdrop with fame pulsing in my bloody head. <laughs> Snap. When the pictures came in the mail, my mother was amused, my father was harumph, and the last word from his lips that night was gay. At least, that is what I remember being the last word, even if there were more. He had called you that once, but I knew you were bigger than that, and that meant I was bigger than that too somehow. When I first moved to Los Angeles for grad school, I called my mother and said, Peggy, this fucking place should be wiped off the face of the earth. <laughs> she winked through the phone. Yeah. When my father emerged from a 10-year absent tenure, lifting the dumb weights of his bulldozed ego, never creative enough as you to alter one, I realized I was face to face with a man who could sell the world. And when he extended his hand kindly, he indeed was kind, but to be good, you need to be more than that. My own olive branch hidden behind my back, I sang to him, I thought you died alone, a long, long time ago. I didn't know this until much later, but I was always a strong-ass motherfucker. <laughs> that is why my father stayed away. That is why my mother winked at me. I guess that means we weren't exactly the same after all, you and I. But that doesn't mean I was drawn to you any less. You gave me a bright knowledge, and I will forever be grateful. Our history is a lightning bolt, first across the chest, and then across a field, and then a continent. I never saw you live, I'm, I'm sorry, I never saw you live, and life has traveled far, but you've lived in me all this time. And when you strung out in heaven's high, I thought I had hit an all-time low. But that was brief, this sigh one must release for a star man, the necessary wailing grief of a changed fairy tale of world. I knew the heart of you was here, within your thin white duke, within your tin machine. It echoed in the cathedral of my memory, as a child dancing, as an adult dancing your gleaming white background light. And now this time, you the one winking as you sang, let the children lose it. Let the children use it. Let all the children boogie. <laughs>